Very good. Thank you. Uh, excited to be here. Uh, joining in on presentation number two. So uh, be hard to top session number one uh, numbers, I think. Huh? Uh, the thinking here of this particular session is is really a whole lot around um, aligning aligning our efforts. When really, when we think about uh, what's happening within school systems uh, uh, or within classrooms across the across different departments, et cetera, of how important it is when we think about uh, the whole cohesiveness aspect of things. So, I um, in terms of uh, full disclosure here, in terms of student focused coaching, we'll be painting and giving some information here around uh, a system within the student focused coaching book called Sales. Sales uh, includes five different systems essentially. And that starts with uh, the first S is about standards, then it's assessments, then it's instruction and intervention, leadership and sustainability. So each of those being different systems that we can consider as we try to uh, try to align effort. The other part that I'm gonna uh, work through and spend a good amount of time on is what we call the collaborative problem solving process. This, as we think about the collaborative problem solving process, something that could be used for uh, any kind of problem, concern, social, uh, you know, social emotional behavior, academic, any grade level, any subject area, and really uh, from a teacher to instructional coach to administrator, someone at the district level, how there's so many different ways to utilize this as a as kind of a, a structured yet systematic uh, approach here. So, so we will so we'll learn about that the collaborative problem solving process as we as we step through the different parts, and so as we do that. I'm going to really encourage you to to be thinking through this lens of of yourself of how how you might how you might work work through this how this might be useful useful to you but but to really stick with me for a bit as I go through these different phases and and talk about this and then we'll pull all the pieces together when we think about how how when we look at student data, student evidence, how that really can help to ground, ground the work and what we're trying to achieve to enhance student learning. So uh, maybe give you some time as well to just think through uh, the process uh, for a phase one problem. I inserted in the sample set of, of data just to show how mm, just looking at one report is, is never enough how we, we always have to be thinking about multiple sources of student data and evidence before we we jump in to try to uh, come up with solutions. And then we can think about how this could actually be used by, by various individuals. Uh, when, when submitting the proposal for this session and trying to connect and thinking about the relationship here is, is just did align it, align it with um, the assessment standard of how, how we really do take and, and use the student data and evidence to, to try to really summarize what it is that, that we're trying to, to work on. But also, what does the data really tell us? Not just a number or looking at a percent, but what can we really, really understand when we look at, at some of the, the, the data? Now, we often start when we think about the collaborative problem solving process and the importance of conversation, you know, we all bring different things to the table. We all have different philosophies, perspectives, uh, likely, I'm not trying to generalize, but uh, we likely all come to the table with different experiences, perspectives, maybe philosophical beliefs, uh, and so on. And so this the importance here of thinking about just conversation in general. And so I'm going to give you give you just a minute here to 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 read these six these six different conversation principles that Margaret Wheatley um, uh, discusses and shares and talks about. And then and then I'm going to go through each of these uh, just to kind of some of her own thinking to share how important it is that when we get into these conversations and think about student data or evidence that 
it can't just be one person and one person making sense of it. It has to be this collective, this cohesive group of individuals. So uh, take just a minute, if you will, uh, read these six, and I'll ask you to, to really hone in on the one that really stands out to you. Uh, and then if you're willing to go to chat and to type your reasoning there, like what, what really speaks to you, uh, go to chat and, and type in what your reasoning was. So for example, I might say, Ooh, the one that really stands out to me is that we have to slow down so we have time to think and reflect. So then I would go to chat and I would type in, what was my reasoning for choosing choosing that one principle? Slow down, what does that mean? So if you'll take just, a, just about a minute here to choose the one that really speaks to you and then take to chat to say your reasoning. Or you can come off mute and just tell us to. That's fine. Here they come, huh? Stay curious. Stay curious. And messy. <laughs> yep. Thank you for, for continuing. Feel free, keep, keep uh, adding here as you go. I find this to be just such just an interesting way to, to sometimes open up uh, with individuals to think about our own, our own way of, of communicating with others, the actual conversations that, that, we, that we allow to happen or that we kind of squash really quickly because I'm in charge and I have the answers. I've got to tell you how to, to do certain things. So I'm going to give you <clears throat> it's a little bit of information here. Uh, so as well, this comes from this, this, uh, this book called uh, Turning to One Another, uh, Simple Conversations to Restore Hope to the Future. Uh, this was introduced to me in 2006, I want to say, when I started my PhD, and I thought when I first when I first got this book and started to flip through it, I thought this is a this is the book we're going to be using for for this PhD course. Like, well, this is this is a hard reading, and and some pages just have hardly anything on them. Uh, however, the depth of the of the text it's so rich and insightful but forces you to have to really ponder some of some of these things so here's what margaret wheatley says <clears throat> and then as we get into to our work just think about how these could resonate and relate so the first one here about we acknowledge one another as equals uh one thing that one thing that we get from margaret wheatley's response is that uh Whatever we know as individuals, it's not sufficient because we can't see enough of the whole. We can't figure things out alone. Someone sees something that the rest of us might need. How powerful that is of Margaret Wheatley here uh, saying again, uh, turning to one another, I can put this in, in chat as well here after a bit or a link to it, but by Margaret Wheatley, simple conversations to restore hope to the future. So that's the first one. We need each other's, we need each other's help. The second one about being curious, 
in the coaching, whether you're, you have a title of coach or whether you are in a role of some kind of administrator, the thought that being curious is so, so important because curiosity, she says, helps us discard our mask and to let down our guard. It creates a spaciousness that is rare in other interactions. And it takes time to create this space. But as we feel it growing, we speak more truthfully and the conversation moves into what's real. So we have to remind ourselves that everyone has something, something to teach, whether I agree or, or disagree. Everyone has something to teach. So holding back and being curious. The next one, we recognize that we need each other's help to become better listeners. That often we might be or feel like, oh, I'm so certain of, of the decision here, what we should do. Or maybe there's uh, the, the feeling of we're just too stressed and, and there's just no time. We just don't have time uh, to listen. But what Wheatley would tell us here is that to acknowledge somebody else is, is we have to learn how to listen. And that that's really hard work sometimes to learn how, how to listen. The third, the fourth one, sorry, we slow down, is that listening is one of the skills required for good conversation. Slowing down is a second because conversation, when we think about this, helps to create conditions where, where each of us really can rediscover this joy of being able to, to think together. And if you think about slowing down and taking the time that many, many of us get an opportunity then to contribute to, to conversation. The next one is remember that conversation is naturally humans think. Language gives us meaning. Uh, the meaning to know each other, to know each other better. But also, when we think about this, if we remember that this is the natural human humans think, we might have to reconsider some of our ways of being. As Margaret Wheatley says, we've cultivated a lot of bad behaviors when we're together. Speaking too fast, interrupting others, monopolizing the time, giving speeches, and some people are rewarded for those behaviors. But none of this leads to wise thinking or healthy relationships. Really important to think about. And the last one, expect it to be messy. You know, life doesn't move in straight lines and neither does a, a good conversation. When you think about how with conversation that everyone should have a chance to, to be heard. And when Wheatley talks about this, is that each person then gets a, a unique opportunity to be able to share their, their own perspectives. And if we jump in too quickly, jumping in too quickly to try to solve problems, we don't really get enough of, enough of, the, of the whole picture. So realize that conversations um, can, be, can be really messy. And the practice of this is conversation takes courage, needs to allow for risks, but it also takes takes time. So I'm gonna challenge you here to think about, to think about these different principles here, but also it's gonna be really interesting to maybe with your own colleagues whom you're working with, uh, for your leading a building, whatever, or even for students, to think about this with students of what conversation could really mean in their in their own, if they were to understand these. So in the student-focused coaching model, uh, three different roles that we really think about, but this one, the collaborative problem solver role is the one that is as a centerpiece. And this one as well, that really requires us to think about conversation. And you see it in the bottom right-hand corner, but I'll put a larger uh, visual up here, the figure. but. This is not um, about a hierarchy. It is not about someone has all the answers because it's unrealistic to think that the roles that we're in, coach, principal, district leader, it's unrealistic to think that any one of us could possibly know 
all things, curriculum, instruction, assessment at all grade levels and all subject areas, very unrealistic. So how do we continue to think about bringing in that voice of others and to really engage others as we think about whether it's an academic behavior or social emotional problem, how can we work together to think about what a problem might be and then to think about how we then go about defining goals and thinking about a focus, an area of reform that we might that we might target. So think that there are no, no quick fixes. There are no quick fixes. In this, the collaborative problem solving process, when we think about this, uh, four different phases, but this is really meant to be fluid. It's meant to be flexible. It's meant to be versatile. I, as a coach or someone in a principal role, it's about helping to manage, but there's no cycle included in this. There's no, we start at one and go to four, and if it didn't work, go back to one. No, uh, this is all about putting individuals uh, to empower them to have these authentic conversations. And so when we think through this, uh, and again, put yourself in the mindset of, oh, you're working through, through something too, is that in this, the first phase, this problem presentation, that the idea of the first phase, whether someone comes to you with a problem, a concern, maybe an area that they really want to target and grow in based on student data and evidence is think of how someone might come with a lot of a lot of input. Uh, yeah, I've really been struggling with teaching something specific or a small group of students who have really struggled or my whole class is really having a hard time with uh, understanding uh, the vocabulary used in text or whatever whatever it might be. But all the white circles, what it represents is many bits of information that someone might give us. That could be real facts, that could be, that could be feelings, could be emotions, it could be, uh, what I have to be careful with is possible hidden agendas that if I can paint this picture in such a way that I could get, uh, I could get Karen out of my classroom because of her behavior problems, I'm gonna really work on painting that picture to get her removed and or sent somewhere else so that's going to fix that's going to fix it all well uh that's that's your vision of this so so when we think about this initial conversation of looking at even a spreadsheet of data state data benchmark data whatever it might be uh, no decision no decision making just think through this as this is one piece of data that we're looking at. The second part of this, when you see the collect data and you see all these question marks, this is where really trying to stress and to think about the problem that you think or the concern that you're having, is it really a problem or concern or might it be something else? And so we start with all these bits of information in terms of what someone thinks could be the problem or concern or an area of growth. And we really try to, to, to stress, we need to collect more data. And when we think about collecting more data, that's what all those question marks are. That could come in the form of interviews with teachers, interviews with students, interviews with family members. Uh, that could come with observing. Maybe it's a teacher said, yes, come in and observe how I'm teaching something. Uh, come in to see how I'm interacting with students. Uh, observe the classroom ecology. What in this room would say that what's here is supportive or really helps to verify that there's a problem? Uh, it could be records review, something like a behavior problem. And I can go back and look over the years if there's something that's been happening. Uh, it could also be, well, let's look at other, other assessments. And that could be looking at assessments in reading, math, science, writing. Uh, it could be other assessments like progress monitoring. But there are so many different sources of data. And so before making decisions and trying to really think about defining a problem and setting goals and actions is to really try to figure out what is the problem. So 
After collecting some number of data, we would say when we think about data triangulation, that's a, that's a really important piece for people to remember. Data triangulation is that we, we, we collect a minimum three different data points. And then we look at all of that data to really then consider and to decide, is there a problem here? Uh, can we verify or confirm what the problem was? Or might it be that what I initially said was a problem? That's not really, that's not really it at all. So, uh, so phase one is all about this initial look at data or hearing about data, including history, context, what is the real problem here? But it's also about understanding what other data we might collect. So that when we come back when we come back together and we're in this phase two part of the process, that now we start to see a lot of different patterns emerging. Yeah, emerging. We could think about this to kind of a the gradient uh, of the, the those white circles that you see. Just the white circles in this phase two, they might represent, oh, those are feelings. Those are emotions that have come through on the part of the data. If we're not making decisions based on feelings and emotions. We're basing our decisions on the student data and the evidence that we collect. The fully shaded in circles, that might represent some real hard facts. You know, the number of absences, uh, so something really concrete and specific, it's right there. But there's likely if we conduct interviews and start to look at other data sources, we're likely going to find that there's a whole lot of other themes that start to start to emerge. It might relate back to what you initially said with all those white circles as you were talking about, and it might not. So as a teacher working through this or as a principal working through this or something at the district office, just this much should get me thinking about getting to something clear. Is there a reform that we're gonna work on? Is there a focus that we can target our attention? Because it can't be a lot of different initiatives happening at one time. It can't be a lot of different programs that we're going to try to uh, implement to fix things. Like that's those are band-aid approaches. What really is the thing that we could target? So as we see that first phase two of verifying and confirming what the problem might be, we then can start seeing this this vertical line, just starting to think about the different patterns that emerge. Notice that the the white circle. Uh, is not included in this vertical list. That's again, we're not basing decisions on, on feelings or emotions. Rather, we've got all these different patterns, but it does allow us to think about a root cause here now. So we could have any number of things that start to show up. Well, now we're gonna have to really think about where do we start? So let's say if there's an example um, of the students who might struggle with making inferences, if that really is something that comes through, some of our additional data that we collected might be observing. A teacher decides that, hey, let's, let's do some observations about how I'm teaching, making inferences. Or let's interview students to see, how does your teacher teach making inferences? Or maybe it's interviewing teachers to understand what they know about how to explicitly teach, making inferences, or this, all the scaffolds that are needed. But all of that information is going to be really helpful for us because we might end up in this place where we start to see that, you know, the real problem in this vertical pattern here is maybe there's little to no training that's ever been provided uh, for teachers on how do you teach such a thing as making inferences? What does that all include? So our root cause might end up being something around, hey, we got to get to this level of general academic vocabulary as a focus that's going to help us then uh, over time get to this place of helping students make inferences. But there's a lot of thinking, the conversation that has to be involved here. So if we can get the problem written out 
and define what the real problem is, then we can start to think about a goal or goals that we want to explore. So if we said that something in that about the problem is about uh, explicitly teaching general academic vocabulary that's going to help increase reading proficiency or lead to uh, uh, better comprehension, well, then our goals would have to align with that. And that might mean that there's going to have to be, uh, if we're going to increase student performance, what's that actually going to look like? Not for goals that are set from beginning to end of year, but maybe they're goals that are like four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks. And we create then an action plan that now helps us to think about how will we get to that achieving that goal to solve this problem. We can't wait to the end of the year to figure this out. But an action plan would then include a number of strategies. This is again, an opportunity to say, yep, our problem here is about academic vocabulary. Our goals is like, we wanna see how uh, training and support can increase this in terms of student learning through teacher sustained professional learning, uh, through opportunities students have to engage or to really think about and apply general academic vocabulary. And so when we start to think about strategies for an action plan, we can all contribute to that. And someone might say, I go, I found this really good activity, this worksheet on this one website and I pay for it and I implement it. Uh, I really like it, but I don't know if it works. Well, we're gonna still validate anything that anybody brings, including evidence and research-based practices. Because in this phase two, what we wanna do is to, yep, we'll validate everybody's ideas. And we're gonna choose a strategy, but we're gonna take that strategy. We're going to apply it to the goal. If I were to have students complete this, this one worksheet, is that really gonna result in the achieving of that goal? Mm likely not, so we can cross that off the list. But there's an opportunity here to go through and really evaluate, really evaluate the types of strategies that we want to implement. Uh, the goals, it's not about how many we have, it's about identifying that goal or goals that are really gonna help us move this one focus forward. Not many, but maybe one. So we get our, our goals here set. The goals would include the who's gonna do what, when, where uh, that might be. When we think about coaching, that could be a department chair in a high school who helps to lead their departments through sustained professional learning. It could be a grade level lead. It could be an aspiring leader. It could be a principal. There's a number of, of ways to think about who's gonna be part of this. And then when we get to uh, having this plan, and a real focused targeted plan, then we go off to implement. But the implementation is gonna require a lot of just ongoing, maybe informal check-ins. I, if I'm a principal or a district person or a coach or whomever, I want, I want to achieve this goal. We didn't set, set these just, just because. We're trying to work together here. So there's gonna be informal conversation about about the goal that we've set, about the implementation, about the progress that we're seeing. But there's also during this time in which we're gonna to have to think about providing some differentiated sustained professional learning, whether that's some during our uh, a grade level or department meeting, whether it's during a faculty meeting, whether it's at the central office providing trainings for teachers or principals, uh, all these things that get us focused in on what it is we're trying to do. Uh, that can be really hard work because it's easier to do a one size fits all approach and everybody gets the same thing. That can be a much easier way. Uh, that doesn't really always help to move the needle forward. Uh, when we come back together then in phase four, this is our opportunity then to think about, uh, did we achieve the goals? It shouldn't be a surprise to us because we've been informally checking in here and monitoring. We've been providing this sustained and differentiated professional learning. So it shouldn't be a surprise when we get to the end to see whether or not we've we've attained or achieved what we set out to do. In some cases, uh, yes, we did. 
In some cases, like you see for goal two, that's not checked off here. Doesn't mean that uh, we're not close, but it might mean that we're gonna come back to that list in phase two that we started. Uh, and maybe we, we choose a new strategy. It might then be that we decide we need a little more time, but it's never about in student focused coaching about a cycle that we're that we're working through. So if to just sort of recap, when you think about this this first phase, so I'm trying to understand the description, the context, the history, uh, what someone brings. I think about all the possibilities of data collection, minimum of three here, data triangulation. We're trying to see patterns that emerge. We're trying to verify uh, and, and really understand whether or not the problem exists. And then, you know, understanding that we're not trying to change people's philosophies, but we can continue to build knowledge based on what we know. Uh, things that we get to understand from whomever, a teacher, a grade level, a department, a whole school, uh, the problem here, the concern that we brought forth. I mean, is this something that has gotten worse over time? Uh, what have we tried in the past? So if it's something like general academic vocabulary, performance in this or making inferences or whatever it is, uh, what interventions have we tried for how long? And who's actually delivered those? Is it one person? Is it all of us? Do we have a sustained way that we're all focused in on doing something similar? Uh, really important in terms of, of this connection. Uh, often, if we were to think about behavior type work or even academics, you know, looking at some of those, those records about attendance. Uh, and that fourth bullet I think is always important is to think about if we were to interview students or even to look at their own academics. If they do some, if they do well in, in, in a different subject, what's the reason? Is it how the teacher delivers things? Is it how the teacher sets things up? Uh, who knows? I'm not trying to assume and I'm not generalizing. I need to get to those sources to really understand what it is they're thinking. So as a qualitative researcher, who I am, uh, uh, just looking at the quantitative aspect, the numbers is never enough for me. There's, there are way too many stories behind those faces uh, to get to, to really try to understand. So we also say, Jan and I, when we were writing Student Focused Coaching is that, you know, as a coach, again, could be another teacher, aspiring leader, department chair, coach could be in the position of a leader, is to uh, really think about our communication skills that we're using, really being, being in the zone with the conversation to listen intently. We talk about this person with two imaginary brains. You have this front brain with a mouth for a reason. You can ask questions, you can paraphrase, you can summarize, all these other things that you can do right here. Uh, but on the backside, really being cautious. I'm skeptical, I'm unconvinced. There could be hidden agendas here. That's why in phase one, we're making no quick decisions. We need to figure out other types of data we're going to be collecting. So here is a, a sample here uh, recently. This came from, from a school there uh, in Ohio. Uh, this is a report I did and to pull, it's a sample. But this is one of these examples where this is not near enough information from my viewpoint to say we can make any decisions. This might be something that someone brings forth during during a phase one conversation uh, to say, this is a this is a data set here that we have. Yeah, you know, when you look at this, what does it really, what does it really tell you? Hmm. It's third grade. I can see these different patterns and the different ways that students are categorized here in terms of scoring from mid or above grade level all the way to three or more grade levels below. I can see that on the, the bars there, the patterns. Another thing I could talk about here, what stands out is that, and we do have uh, some students here who, who are still struggling in the area of phonics in third grade. That's, that's a problem. We do have quite a few students here who are not mid or above grade level in something like vocabulary. 
And then we have that comprehension piece. But so if we were looking at this and thinking about, yeah, we can't make a decision here. I mean, how, how could we? What would be the decision that we would we would make? Where where would we start? So so we would start to seek out some some additional infer oops some uh, additional information, and that might be observing a teacher teaching phonics or vocabulary something in comprehension. That could be talking to students of what is it that they do to learn about vocabulary, comprehension, whatever it might be. That could be looking at school, ecology. If you walk through the hallways, would you find that there's a lot of rich vocabulary used? Uh, or would you find that really the idea of language rich is meant for in the classroom? I don't know. That's something that would have to be would have to be thought about. But I could take something like this and really then start to, to start to think about this in terms of what could be a real problem here. And as I said during that first one, I think we get ourselves to a place of thinking that, you know what, one real thing out of all of this could be something around vocabulary. If we know that that's a foundational piece for uh, for comprehension, but we also know that there's a there's a link with phonics and vocabulary too, with the the morphemes, the different structures of of words. So maybe that's that's where we where we end up. Uh, so that being the first part, and then getting to this place of the definition, the goals, thinking about our our action plan, and then how are we going to to support this, uh, the implementation and being able to really be able to continue to provide that ongoing support and learning. And so I wanna pause here for, for just a moment to see if there are any questions thus far about this, whether you're a principal, a teacher, district level, uh, doesn't really matter. This could be a way for you to dive into and really try to identify a, a focus to really, really support. And as a principal, it's also become a way to think, this could really be a, a way for us to identify what our professional learning community will be all about. Because PLCs, yeah, uh, a first step is to have meeting time, but that's not a PLC. The PLC as a professional learning community, we would have an identified area that we're really trying to hone in on and then think about that ongoing learning uh, that could happen if we were able to step through and create some kind of plan. So no, just let's get a lot of goals in our campus improvement plan for compliance. And let's get really streamlined. So any uh, thoughts, questions, responses thus far, uh, from the collaborative problem solving process before I then go into the sales framework that could be a piece that's really part of, of the phase three with the ongoing support. Any questions, thoughts, comments? Feel free to pop those into the chat box and we'll make sure that Dr. Mickle can see those. Oh, Megan says, no, makes good sense to her. Great, thank you, Megan. Appreciate that. Uh, all right, so yeah, keep them keep them coming if you have things. But this would then help us to see in that third phase the sales framework. Uh, when we think about the sales framework in these five different systems, uh, each of these each of these uh, plays a really critical role in terms of our work. And when we think about these as systems, you know, if we were to say that in that collaborative problem solving process that, yep, something around general academic vocabulary is our problem, that's how we set our goals, and then these are our actions. Well, if we were to say that, then that would mean in the standards portion, if we really thought about standards with vocabulary, do we have a system in place 
for how we really look and think about teaching general academic vocabulary. You went up and down the hallways and asked different teachers in your building, or you talked to different teachers throughout a district. Would they say that there's a way? And by a way, I'm not talking about we look for nouns and verbs and that tells us, because to me that's very superficial, not near enough in terms of the thinking of this. So if we don't have a real clear way of engaging other people in terms of thinking about standards, then it's gonna be really hard for us to assess that standard at the appropriate levels of thinking or rigor, because we don't, we don't necessarily know the standard. So assessing is gonna be really hard to get valid and reliable and useful results. And if we can't get valid, reliable, useful results, because we don't really understand the standard, that's gonna be really difficult to plan for instruction and intervention, because where are we going? What is it we're really trying to, to achieve here? So leaders in this whole process here have to be thinking about, they can't possibly know all of this. Just the realization of being vulnerable and saying, I don't have all the answers, folks. I'm, I don't have quick fixes. And I'm not going to just be about buying things. That's not, that's not the solution. It definitely is not the solution for that last piece about sustainability. So as we think through this and we think about sales in general, if we can educate and really include these conversations with multiple individuals to come up with some clear understanding of how we as a system look at standards, that's gonna be much more sustainable than to think I could have the answer, the reading specialist at the district could have the answer, the math specialist, uh, whomever it is, that's one person's thinking. We have to figure out ways to get those people in the trenches, in the classrooms to also have this voice along with, along with students. So I pulled um, uh, two examples here, two different standards here for examples. Uh, one of these, K through five, determine the meaning of words and phrases as they're used in a text, including figurative language such as metaphors and similes. That's a lot right there. The second one, for six through 12, interpret words and phrases as they're used in text, including determining technical, connotative, and figurative meanings, and analyze how specific language choices shape meaning, mode, or tone of the text. That's a lot. And if we were to take these two pieces, regardless if you're K5 or 612, this is a K12 standard. It's not gonna happen fast. It's not gonna happen in a day or a week. This is gonna be a long term. So what does the system do to help us really think about this as systemically of how we go about teaching this standard? What is it really even asking for? So these might be two places. I go to these as Common Core, the college and career readiness standards often for reading because what I find in those are they all relate to the other subject areas and electives. All of this that's on this slide right now is something that any teacher in a building probably needs to understand clearly. These are things that if I'm a principal, I should know how to model for others or to at least teach others or at least be engaged in the learning. And these are things from a central office that maybe we have to be showing and modeling for others. So as I think about this, the, another book that I'm working on with instructional leadership through student-focused coaching, that this is about how do we create these conditions for successful coaching, but how also do we as instructional leaders, if that's what we are, how do we model our own learning around this? Faculty meetings could be great opportunities to introduce something or a way for us to put our heads together and think about this. Our grade level or department meetings could be ways for us to continue to, to demonstrate or to practice some of the things that we're working, we're working on. But all of that takes time to really think through. But if I find myself as a uh, central office, I've made the decision here of what this is, mm. 
I still have to figure out a way to teach other people. How do I model this? Uh, the system has to see it. So when I understand what these things really mean, then I could think about the data collection, but I could also think about how we take this and think about a problem definition goals or actions. So if we were to say that, you know, during that phase three, that phase three when we're implementing, if we said that it was general academic vocabulary and that's what we wanted to hone in on, uh, that quote there at the top that you, that you see about, this comes from uh, Jan and I writing, but it comes from Joyce and Showers, Bruce Joyce and Beverly Showers from the early 1980s. A one day PD session is never going to work. And we give six hours of learning about vocabulary and strategy. No, never gonna work. It's not gonna result in much in terms of long-term use. It might result in some positive change around what I know about vocabulary, but it's not gonna really help for long-term use because it's too quick and it's often way too much. And it's often, but I don't know how this is gonna work in my own classroom, in my own school, because this, this PD session is not about the students who are in my classroom. It's not that makeup. So what I put here on the slide is if you decided that your data, the student data and evidence got us to this place where this is what we decided was gonna be our focus was general academic vocabulary, we could put together a pretty good differentiated sustained professional learning plan to deepen our knowledge. It might be that at the beginning of the school year, after we looked at the data and made these decisions together, maybe one of our first learning sessions, that could be an hour, could be 45 minutes, it doesn't have to be six hours. What does the research even tell us about vocabulary instruction? Maybe there's, maybe there's a, um, an article that's included. You know, if you've, if you've, uh, if you've never read the the article by Hart and Risley from the '90s, um, the the uh, the early catastrophe, the 30 million word gap by age three, that might be one way to just get started to understand what the research. Why are we doing this? What's really important here? But we don't need to know all the research around vocabulary. It's an understanding of what is it that we really need to know here? And we might give people a week or so to go off and talk with departments, uh, other teacher colleagues, other people in other schools to just kind of ponder, what does this really tell us? And if we bring back evidence the next time we come together, we can share out some of the things that maybe we do. What are the successes we have in teaching vocabulary? What might be some of the challenges that we've faced with? But the next time we're together, we might start to deepen our knowledge by, by getting into this idea of academic vocabulary. What does that even mean? Because there are basic words, there's some general academic words, there's some content specific vocabulary. But if we're talking general academic, we should really spend some time thinking about this. What really is it? And if I then said, you know, for the next week or so, just kind of look look through what it is that you're you're teaching. Are you teaching more general academic vocabulary or mostly content specific? Content specific enough for students to pass a test or general academic of things that I'm likely going to be used for the rest of my life. So uh, what is that? What does that really mean? We might then spend some time letting people ponder that. And the next time we come back together, now we get into some of these vocabulary standards. What does, what does, what do these standards mean? Are we on the same page? Do we know what they are? Do we know what the different skills are? What do these things really actually mean anyway? And we could relate that to Norman Webb's depth of knowledge work in terms of really thinking about that complexity and level of rigor, uh, but then send people off. Hey, 
between now and our next time together, spend some time in your own vocabulary standards because every subject area, elective, all levels have vocabulary in their standards. And if you wanted to spend even more time to look at, look at your own assessments that are administered. Look at a math, a state math test that students take. You don't read word problems that only consist of mathematical content specific language. You have a whole lot of general academic vocabulary on those tests. And if I can't figure out the meaning of those words, that's gonna be hard for me to do any procedure. So we might come back the next week then and we share out some of the things that we've learned. What have we noticed? And maybe then the next time we dive into this tiered vocabulary, tier one, just basic vocabulary. Most kids come to kindergarten with some of that knowledge. It can be taught through visuals, actions. Uh, tier two, general academic vocabulary. Uh, and then tier three, the content specific. We could go off and look at our own core programs. What is the vocabulary that's taught here? How are we teaching this? Which words would we want to choose in terms of that general academic? Maybe we bring some things back. The next week we could talk about disciplinary literacy. How are we teaching vocabulary in all subject areas? Is it similar? Is it different? Do we always do the same thing for our model every time for every word? Uh, hey, that's fine to use, but some differentiation might, might be helpful for, for some as well the real life connections, but is there a system for how we do this? Uh, and then we can continue, language rich environment. We should be able to walk through the halls and to see that there's some effort and emphasis on, on general academic vocabulary throughout our school, not just in classrooms. Then we might move into how do we explicitly teach that? Nothing goes fast when we think of this, but Change takes a, a long time. Shirley Hort and Jean Hall said this many decades ago that in their research, uh, change takes anywhere from three to five years. That's not just randomly chosen. It's from their research finding that we say we're changing something, but that means everyone in the, within the organization has to make the change. And so there will be holdouts of, I'm good with how I teach vocabulary. There are gonna be others who are all on board that I see that there's a real need here. But, but think about the impact of what this could do in a system if we all had a common focus and we used our available time to keep studying and learning it's not just informational time. I studied meetings for my PhD, meetings in schools. And I'll tell you just from feedback from people of how, uh, no, there's some of the learning of, yeah, you can't really send out memos or emails because people won't read them. And you know, there's also though the opposite, but you could have everyone sitting in front of you and not, not listening to you at all. So. Why not be proactive and think about every use, every time you have available that we use it for learning. That could be a power. There is time. It's likely how we use the time to, to dive in. So if we were to say that we were doing this over the course of our four, six, eight weeks, because we're really trying to enhance and really think about this area of general academic vocabulary and how we could tie in the phonics piece with the morphemes, et cetera, but also how this could impact the knowledge base about vocabulary and the decoding part, the impact it could have on fluency, the impact it could have on comprehension. Uh, how powerful, powerful is that? So when we get to the end of this, uh, depending upon what we've decided, we should have a lot of other data that we've been looking at along the way to see whether or not we've, we've been able to, to really take and think about how this, how this all could, could work. It'd be a really powerful approach. So uh, I'm curious here at this, at this point in time, if there's any uh, brave individual out here, or if you're willing to go to chat and to think about in your own role, if you are in a district, 
and you wanted to use this process, what might you do? How might you go about using this process? Getting yourself focused. It's not, we have a reading initiative and a math initiative and, and a special ed initiative. Uh, and just, it's just one initiative in reading and just one in math. Yeah, but if I'm the first grade teacher, these are three new things that you're expecting me to learn and to learn really fast. Uh, that's that's not going to work very well. Uh, so if you're in a district level and thinking about initiative, how might this support that learning? If you were a principal, how might, how might you take some of the state data maybe that you're getting back now and end of year data and to think about planning for next year? If you're in a coaching role, how could you see yourself using the collaborative problem solving process with with a teacher who wants to do more coaching with you or a department. It's not forced. Nobody has to go through this, but but it could be a real way to, to allow um, others to have a lot of input. But also as a teacher, just think of it as a teacher, using something like this with students, when you look at planning for uh, a particular unit or something. Anybody willing to... Um, uh, come off mute or go into uh, to chat to say how they could see this being used in in the role that they're in. Come on, some brave, someone brave. Hey, yes, we have a taker. All right, who has their hand up? I just had to look. Okay, doctor, uh, let me. Um, okay, you should be able now, doctor, free to unmute yourself. Try that. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I will be brave. I'm a verbal processor. So um, I was thinking about this from an administrative lens. And how I would use this. First of all, I really appreciate this body of work and this information. I love the no quick fixes, you know, because I constantly say that, especially when you're we're dealing with such um, intricate, wicked problems. So I would look, I think I, from an administrative and from a district lens, I would use this framework just how it is. So looking at the problem, and I'm new to the district that I'm in now, I just started in April. And I'm the equity and inclusion coordinator. So I really came in just really trying to assess and see what the needs are of the district at whole, right? So what are they? Um, hearing from the people, going to the various schools. I'm talking to some people have, who have been past consultants, um, talking to students, talking to families. So I definitely knew that needed to be a starting point for me. But then when you start talking about defining a problem and you know that's where my antenna is really in then phase two and phase three and phase four, that's where I really started to say, how can I? So bear with me here. This is what I was coming up with and then some of it's gonna just come out now. So like I'm defining, so once I have all that information and I'm in a process of now of like really looking at it. So right now I believe I'm at phase two. Um, in a place where I can, I didn't start yet to define what is the problem. And I like how you said like this vertical line, there's many, there might be many thing, many problems here that can contribute to um, one, that can contribute to a multiple, multiple a litany of things. But then phase three, implement into the tap. So just figuring out like taking one of them and just, you know, dwelling, you know, talking with this superintendent, we don't want a bunch of initiatives. So really focusing on just one or two things that might help alleviate the problem, whether it is culturally relevant um, teaching and really supporting teachers with that practice or the science of reading or both of them, right? And seeing how they correlate and seeing how those even correlate and show up in um, the evaluation system. So again, just starting small is really where I was going with this model and before, you know, just trying to, you know, come up with a litany of solutions. Yeah, yeah. 
really important. And thank you for your willingness to come off and to share this because the whole idea, even that of thinking from an equity and inclusion lens that maybe we see that as a general problem in some kind of student data, but maybe it's really around the evidence because of the evidence and the feedback of what we get. And if we were really to think about then the equity and inclusion, the opportunities to talk to different groups. I mean, you could end up with three sources of jaded data just through interviews. If you were to think about focus group interviews with some family members, some students, some teachers, uh, getting people to just talk about, what do they even know about equity? What do they know about inclusion? How would you create this ideal space where everyone feels as though things are equitable, that everyone is included? What would you do? How would you create this? And these opportunities that could be so open and then to think about how these things get, get, woven, get woven in. You might find though very quickly that people don't really even know what equity inclusion they don't even know what that stuff means. They hear these words all the time and that, yeah, that's what we should, yep, it should be equitable and yep, we should include everyone, yet maybe I'm just business business as usual. So I gotta really think about this. Uh, I wanna also, I'm gonna pull up one other thing that I think is important here then, is that if we took Dr. Three, uh, am I saying your name correctly, Dr. Three? Yeah, so if we, if we said that, then we would find likely here that, oops, what I just said a minute ago of how a one day professional development on equity and inclusion is gonna do nothing. It might give us a little bit of information, but here is something that I, I think is really important for people to understand is that when we look on the left side of this, this particular slide, Look at what Joyce and Showers, Bruce Joyce and Beverly Showers found in 1982 about for teachers to learn about and implement a new skill, not three new initiatives, not a new program, uh, or not, not even a new program, like a part of that. All of this time that we likely have to devote, we need more time to study. We need to see demonstrations. We need time to practice. And we need these opportunities for the coaching, that support. Uh, I know this might look to some people like, oh, we never have that kind of time. I think you would find you have a whole lot of time. It's how you use your time. Introducing equity in a faculty meeting. It doesn't have to be just a lecture based, but it could be a whole series of how we think about equity inclusion uh, for the next six weeks. What's that gonna look like as teams come together, as they dive into their, their high quality instructional materials, whatever. If you look on the right-hand side, the table too, is that this, this also shows us from Bruce Joyce and Emily Calhoun of how until we get some of these opportunities for practice and that sustained coaching support, it's going to be really hard to get things in a long-term practice. And here's a part of that I think comes from when you think of purchasing a new curriculum, a new program, whatever it might be, uh, these are not written specific to your school. These are written for the masses. And so to think about how is this really going to work with the students whom whom we serve. Is it going to be effective for our push-in inclusion students? Will this program or initiative really support our gifted and talented students? What about our English learners? What about whatever? And so not only um, to think about this, of how important it is to think we have to have a plan of action of how are we going to do this work and to make it sustainable. A one-time thing is, is not going to work. The other part of this that I think is really important to consider is that um, Lee, uh, uh, named L.I., did this nine-year longitudinal study. And this nine-year longitudinal study in Hong Kong schools is really interesting 
really interesting here because a part of what came out of this is that we should not be making big decisions that everybody does something at the same time. We should making, be making some decisions based around what we know about successful school reform. And that is that we focus and build, we start small. Ah, we learn about this equity and inclusion from, from your example there or general academic vocabulary. Uh, we decide on something that maybe from what we've learned and the data that we've collected now or the evidence, hey, here is something that we might try but we're not gonna spend lots of money and stuff on this until we know how it works. So we're gonna seek out maybe some of those early adopters, some of those eager and open individuals who can help us to pilot something. Let's test this out. Let's really think about how this is gonna work within the classrooms, uh, the classrooms and the students whom we're serving. Let's gather some feedback here from the teachers. Let's gather some feedback from the students as we implement something, something new. And then if it's working and we're seeing that the data uh, is showing that, oh yeah, there's some real results here. This really might work. Then we can gradually scale up. But I do often think that the quick buying of stuff that everybody has to do is, is that the best decision knowing that who are we serving and who are we working with? That's not to say we won't get there, but eager and open, focus and build, gradually scale up. You get to deepen and broaden that reform. You get to tackle challenges as, as they arise, but you get to tackle these challenges with, with others. And it's not forcing everybody to make a quick change because I'm really comfortable in what I'm doing. Yep, get it. And that would be supported in the change theory, three to five years. Some people it's gonna take a lot longer to see, but for those early adopters who start to really see results, if it's working, wow, they're gonna be the people who we're gonna tap into as our, our positive testimonials. Those who can really say that by doing this, this, this is what's happening. Uh, that then often helps to get other people to want to learn a little bit more. But, but when we think about this as just the whole collaborative problem solving process, that yeah, our our main thing here is to, to oops, our main thing here is to to let's let's get ourselves focused first on what is, what is the reform, what is the the focus, what are we really trying to achieve? And let's collect. Let's collect the necessary data here to, to really identify and show that, that this is something that we need to, to target. But we're going to ground it in student data and evidence and multiple sources. So here might be uh, a few things that you take, you could test out as you, as you go on from, from this session is, is maybe just starting with, I mean, is there a problem, a concern, uh, or maybe something that based on student data and student evidence, something that I, I want to improve upon. It doesn't always have to be a problem, but, but it's also, this isn't about feel good. Like I want to go through the collaborative problem solving process, but I really want to, I'd really like to get better at my reading center. Yeah. For what purpose? What do you want to get better at your reading center for? What does the data and the evidence have to do and tell us that I need to do better in that center? Uh, so think about this problem, concern, or, or area to improve upon. What data might you collect? And really look to see what could that tell you before any quick fixes, solutions, quick band-aids. Or maybe you think about this through a school administrator and instructional coach as they work through this to say, hey, here the next six weeks, because this is our focus, this is what our differentiated, sustained professional learning is going to look like. It doesn't have to be a one size fits all, but it does take time to plan out how to differentiate things. Yes, it's easier. Everybody gets the same thing. That's not always the most effective way. Uh, maybe I could think about this through the implementation, how the process could align uh, what everybody what everybody is doing. How are all stakeholders helping us to really close this this gap that we've that we've found? Uh, 
or even just thinking about with families, are there ways that this could could be used? So uh, our goals here for, for this particular session was to, yeah, really kind of think through and introduce you to the this four-phase collaborative problem-solving process, uh, thinking about how the sales framework, standards assessment, instruction and intervention, leadership and sustainability could be could be used as we really try to get a good grasp. Not one person should be deciding on what the priority standards are. People have to put their heads together and really make sense of these. And yes, it is important to understand multisyllabic words. That might not be the priority standard, but that is gonna be something that comes into play when we think about vocabulary and the phonics and the structures. Uh, so all those things of it takes takes a lot of people to be to be involved in this work. And then last to think about, uh, as you were just doing Dr. Three, of thinking about how I could actually, how could this be this be used? So uh, my contact information is here. Uh, feel free if you want to reach out, you have questions. Uh, I, I, I do use uh, Twitter. I, I go to LinkedIn. I'm not a big social media person, but, but I'm the Twitter people. There are some people in there who I, I learned, I learned a whole lot from. So uh, feel free though, uh, reach out. But thank you all for those of you who are able to, to join. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. So I'll turn it back to uh, Karen and Julie.